very uh, very dispiriting and silencing a room in such a nice hum and buzz uh, kind of running through it. Um, so I'm sorry to do that, but we will we will be very brief. Uh, the formal remarks that we'll make here will uh, we'll just take a few moments, but we're celebrating something very special tonight. Um, uh, and I'm, it's my absolute pleasure to um, to be here to help mark this occasion and to, to welcome you all to Ireland House. Um, I see so many members of our extended family uh, here, as well as uh, a family that we're, we're so delighted to make a further connection with, which is the Quinlan family, who are here tonight. Um, there are too many people here to name. I'm, I'm very pleased that that uh, that so many people have come together on this afternoon um, to mark what I think is is uh, something in, our, in 18 years since Ireland House opened. Uh, this marks a very particular moment in our long calendar of, of good events. Uh, I believe that great poets in the care of great and passionate teachers can open the future and, and truly unlock the mind. I can count the doors open to me in my life by my first reading of Seamus Heaney's poetry in a class on contemporary lyric poetry taught by Peter Sachs at Johns Hopkins uh, many years ago. That class unlocked a passion in my own life as a student and now as a teacher. And I've had the ever-evolving sponsorship of Seamus Heaney's art at every step along the way since then. Indeed, the doors to Ireland House, I think, were open to me because I've been really quite lucky to carry and to share the fire that we find in Seamus and the other poets who we, we teach in this house. It's especially fitting to welcome Seamus and Marie Heaney today because Seamus helped open Ireland House on the day that it was founded and when uh, the very journey that began to realize the vision uh, of Lou and Loretta Glucksman um, that we are so lucky to, to try to bring into to reality every day uh, that we work here. Seamus is here today because we're announcing a new partnership between the Seamus Heaney Center for Poetry at Queen's University Belfast and Glucksman Ireland House here at NYU. We have a new endowed lectureship that we are announcing today, joining the O'Malley Lecture in the Moynihan uh, and the Irish Institute Lecture. This one is in poetry and will be known as the Tom Quinlan Annual Lectureship. And we're very happy to welcome back long-term Ireland House member Tom Quinlan and member of his, of his family uh, who made this generous donation. In November, November the Seamus Heaney Center will name the second annual winner of the Seamus Heaney Poetry Prize, which goes to the author of the best first collection of poetry published the previous year in Ireland and in the UK. And early next year, that person will come here to give the first Thomas Quinlan Lecture, which we imagine will be, in fact, a, a reading and a celebration of poetry. Um, we'll also make sure that the Heaney winner is available to members of the NYU community. And we'll also look to bring that person to, look, to interact with local high school uh, teachers as well. Because the Heaney Center is a focal point for creativity in Ireland and is recognized as an international center of creative research and uh, creative and research excellence in the field of literature. And central to the center's ethos is the encouragement of emerging talent. And I'd like to think that that's, uh, again, another reason why this partnership is so fitting between NYU and Queens. We also think that the tie-in between the two universities is especially appropriate once you hear a bit about the background of the person being honored tonight. And here to introduce uh, his father is Joe Quinlan, also a longtime member of Ireland House and an MA student here in our program. Joe. Thank you, John. Uh, and thank all of you, especially Seamus, uh, for coming out on a, on a Sunday afternoon to join us for this announcement. Uh, I just have a few comments before I introduce my father to you uh, and tell you about his career as both a teacher and a, and a student of poetry, a career that now extends over eight decades down in his native Philadelphia. I have to admit, I still get a chill every time I step through the front door here. It's such a special place. This, this house is such a gracious and remarkable facility and it's surpassed in my mind only by the remarkable programs that we have here. Uh, it's certainly a tribute to Loretta and Lou Glucksman for their vision of what was possible here and for that I salute them and once again thank them. Mayor Lou and I are happy to make this gift and we plan to continue to spread the word near and far that this is a program that is worthy of strong and continued financial support. 
We began attending events here in the mid-90s, shortly after it opened, when we, when we first moved downtown. And no surprise, shortly thereafter, uh, September of 96, we, we visited Ireland together for the first time. I remember that because Wexford won the All-Ireland that September. <laughs> Uh, now we go most every year, sometimes twice. Uh, in 1997, after my father began riding the train up here for his, uh, the lectures and readings, uh, we heard here about the Yates Summer School in Sligo and decided to treat him to a visit. And in short, Sligo was a hit. Uh, he's been there ten times now, in fact. Always bringing back signed copies. I was showing Seamus earlier from 1997, his books, but also Seamus Dean, John Cavanaugh, Evan Bolden, etc. This is this was our mementos of the, of the different years there. Um, he was always eager to see the lineup of seminars and speeches, and he was especially fond of uh, Helen Bendler's classes. And whenever the names Heaney or Longley appeared, he circled those dates. Two of the years that he skipped Sligo, incidentally, in, in, in his late 70s, he took month-long trips solo to central China on a volunteer project, no expenses paid. Uh, teaching English to new university students in Xi'an. Another side benefit uh, of, our, of the trips to Sligo, and I would sometimes tag along for a few days at the beginning or the end of the trip, uh, is that I was able, with the help of a wonderful man named Frank Roof, uh, to find the birthplace of my, f of my dad's grandmother, uh, Cecilia Cox, born to two uh, famine survivors, John Cox and Sarah Hines, in 1862. She was born four miles outside of Enniskillen in County Fermanagh. Frank Roof uh, worked in the local town hall there, and he read an online posting I made uh, of some vague family legends and rumors I'd heard from cousins. And on his own time, he did the legwork uh, to find out not only the place, but also the people. My father's uh, wonderful second cousin, Chrissy Doyle, and her husband, and their family, who still live nearby. Describing one roots in, uh, in Fermanagh, specifically in and around Enniskillen, was an emotional experience for both of us. My dad never met his grandmother. Uh, Cecilia Cox died in Philadelphia uh, shortly after my father was born. She was one of eight children, and she herself had eight, the oldest of whom was my grandfather. Uh, and I can't help thinking how, uh, how amazed and happy she would be uh, to see her grandson do, being on here today. Uh, but beyond family connections, I know that uh, finding our family roots in Fermanagh, it has led me uh, personally to want to learn more and to think more and then learn more again about Irish history, old and new. Uh, and certainly to support groups like the American Ireland Fund, Peace Players International, who are working in Ulster, but also look for opportunities to support efforts to help build a new and better future in the North. And that is why we are so pleased to be involved in this new initial tie-in with Queen's University and the Haney Center and the Haney Prize. Now, a few numbers and dates worth noting about Tom Quinlan. The number is 63. This fall will mark his 63rd year as a teacher, teacher of literature and English, some 43 long years in the Philadelphia public school system where he taught days and after school and nights and weekends to support his family. During his so-called retirement, he's been teaching poetry at a suburban Philadelphia college, uh, uh, a wonderful continuing way program at Delaware Valley College now for 20 years. And Mary Lou and I had the uh, opportunity and uh, chance to visit a couple of his classes this past spring, and we were actually dazzled, uh, truly, by the atmosphere. It's two dozen students. Uh, the median age was about 87, uh, <laughs> hung on every word of the professor's riffs and eagerly took their chances to recite the works first of John Keats and the second session of Elizabeth Bishop. Now seeing my dad still on his game was thrilling, but in some ways not surprising. Uh, in some households, a child hears names of movie stars or sports heroes or even politicians, but in my case it was different. What I distinctly remember is hearing of Wordsworth and Dunn and Gerard Manley Hopkins and the Brownings and Thomas Kinsella and Dylan Thomas and on and on. My father likes to say he was born just three weeks before the first issue of the New Yorker magazine was published, which was February the 14th, 1925. As far as I know, he has read it most every week, yes, for 63 years. And when he is spotted, for instance, at a Phillies game, 
with a folded copy of the New Yorker under his hand. He is not carrying it for show and not for the cartoons. He's carrying it for the poetry. He perhaps read a new poem and he is still thinking about it and he wants to keep it nearby for just another quick read. The number 63 is also important to my father because he celebrated his 63rd anniversary just one week ago, last Sunday. He will be heading home, though, tonight uh, at 6 o'clock because he insists on being the primary caregiver for my mother, Jenny, who is in good spirits but not the best of health. Um, but if she were here, she would want you to know, although she moved to Philadelphia as a 13-year-old, her heart will always be in her native Brooklyn. <laughs> As John noted, uh, we hope to work uh, out some appearances with the Haney Award winner at local public schools, maybe even Brooklyn. They're up for it to get them down to Philly. Uh, we plan on spreading the word about the award here, and about the Haney Center, and about Queens. And we certainly will have a party or two to go along with the formal reading next year, and hopefully including our musician, our house musicians here uh, from, 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 uh, from Ireland House. The, um, I'm happy today that we have um, a bit of a posse here. Uh, we have uh, Tom's children, his grandchildren, his spouses, two old friends who were teachers from Philadelphia, all of whom love him and share in his deep love of poetry. One thing I should confess, and some of you know this, by the way, is the only person here who did not know about this new lectureship until he arrived is, is the honoree himself. Uh, I truly was a little worried he might try to wave it off or perhaps not even show up. Uh, it's not because he's shy, because he certainly is not, but he is very modest. Uh, but I also knew we'd want to hear from him, so what I asked him to do is to do what he does best, to pick a favorite poem and be prepared to share with the nice folks here at Glucksman's. So proudly I give you Tom Quinlan to, uh, to read the poem he's yeah, yeah, yeah. Good speech. <laughs> I know it was a good speech, because I wrote it. <laughs> I read a little poem by Patrick Cavanaugh. Bank walk. You know, poets through the years see some little element in nature and write poems about it, and the world is a different place. Keats wrote a poem, sitting under a plum tree, and I heard a bird sing. And oh, do a nightingale became part of our life. And Yeats, standing by a little lake in Ireland, saw 59 birds flying in the sky, and the result was magic. Where's red soil? Some flowers growing in the fields. And daffodils became part of our life. Patrick Cavanaugh spent some time walking on along the banks of the canal in Dublin, sitting under a beech, a beech tree, and looking at the water, looking at the birds, and listening to the sounds of life around him, and wrote this poem called Canal Bank Walk. And his life was changed, and our life too. He looked at the leaves, he looked at the water, and he saw the purification element. And this is what poets do. They, the magic of poetry is to transfer this 
this beauty, this joy, this inexpressible common into language. Canal Bank Walt. Leafy with love, banks, and the green waters of the canal pour in redemption for me, that I do the will of God, and wallow in the habitual, the banal, and grow with nature again as before I grew. The bright stick trapped the breezes, adding a third party to the couple kissing on an old sea. And the bird gathering materials for the nest of the word. Eloquently now abandoned in his delirious beat. O oh, unworld world, enrapture me and capture me. In a web of fabulous grass, eternal voices by a beach. Feed the gaping need of my senses and give me ad lib to pray unself-consciously with overflowing speech. For this soul needs to be honored with a new dress woven from green and blue things and arguments that cannot be proven. Thank you. There's a bit of fire, uh, obviously, isn't it? Uh, it's clearly that the case that Tom has been uh, been carrying it into the classrooms uh, with great force and passion. Uh, for many long years. We're uh, so pleased that, that he was able to come today and that this lectureship uh, can be announced. And I, I want to just close by um, thanking you all for coming and thanking especially Seamus Heaney for, for making time in his schedule to, to come here and to, to grace us with your presence again, but also to, 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 for yourself and Mari to be in the door and, uh, inside the house and reminding us why we do this, uh, why we're so lucky to do this. Um, Say a few words. Oh, and, and, and Seamus, his, his graces uh, will say a few words. Thank you so much, Seamus. We're very pleased. Yeah. Just thought this was much too, <coughs> too meaningful and, and emotional event to leave it like that. Um, and uh, having been here early on, it is a great pleasure to come back. And I was thinking of <coughs> coming into the Glucksman field of force here. <laughs> We've all been uh, affected by it, and the better for it. <coughs> so I was asking Mary before we came, could she help me with this stanza of, of W.B. Yeats? Maybe Tom could. Uh, <laughs> it's it's uh, Yeats writing about Lady Gregory and the house. <coughs> Where, where they were in Cool Park and where so much took place and so many people were attracted into a kind of <coughs> energy that was common and purposeful, rather like this. Uh, what's this? I've forgotten how it starts. <laughs> yeah. It came like swallows and like swallows went. Yet one woman's powerful character could keep a swallow to its first intent. And half a dozen information there, the dum de dum de dum de dum de dum, <laughs> <laughs> found certainty 
upon the dreaming air the intellectual sweetness of those lines that cross through that cut through time or cross it with her shins the intellectual sweetness of the lines that cross through time are very evident here and the affection of this family and their generosity is exemplary uh, Tom will know that having a lecture named after you gives you the uneasy feeling, should I go to it or not? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I found myself in that situation myself. <laughs> uh, uh, Joe Lee gave a lecture about, about me recently and uh, in a series called James Heaney Lectures. <laughs> and and uh, there were eight considerable persons of the literary and intellectual world of Ireland contributing to this and I thought it would be an insult if I don't go but Christ if I go it's going to be far worse <laughs> <laughs> sitting opposite of them anyway the other, the other thing I remember about uh, names of things Brian Friel uh, I, I've had a couple of things in the me. like Friel and myself Brian Friel and myself had, have had uh, uh, routes streets named for us in somewhere outside Derry and uh, there's a Brian Field Street and a Haney Street and <laughs> Brian said well mine's going to be a cul-de-sac he said <laughs> <laughs> so I was thinking mine probably will end up with a, a roundabout or rotary at the end of the <laughs> They also had a pub name for me in in Rome. <laughs> in Rome. Yeah, and uh, we went to it. Uh, I don't know whether it's still the name's still on it or not. It was a kind of Guinness franchise, I think, it was, <laughs> it was supplied. But um, for the prize, also, I'm very great, very grateful for the commitment to to the poetry prize in Queens. And to have that Queen's NYU connection is terrific. Uh, a first book is very important in any writer's life. It changes the sense of self. Uh, it promises and it tests the future for you. So a first book, uh, getting a prize, is a very important, meaningful thing in that writer's life. And as Tom said so powerfully, change, that change changes things, changes the world. Uh, I myself must report, and I'll finish now, um, when I got a certain prize, I, I was <laughs> full of unease. Uh, Christ, James Joyce didn't get this prize. No. <laughs> Look, Samuel Beckett got it. Uh, <laughs> yes, got it. <laughs> What am I going to do? And I went up home to County Derry and uh, everything was soothed a bit for me when, when our neighbour, Billy Steele, a local farmer, asked me a simple question. He said, uh, congratulations on the winnings, Seamus. <laughs> <laughs> Here to the people who supply the winnings. <laughs>